Okay. The dead will <coughs> rise, righteous meet in the skies, go okay. where no um. one dies, heavenward bound. What are we doing? I've got to get the volume turned down so we don't get feedback here. Oh. I see one person. Hey, Wanda. Back. Wanda. I love you. I hear you do this. Are y'all preparing? Are y'all getting prepared, Wanda? <laughs> I think Wanda lives prepared. Wanda does. Wanda and Mike live prepared. Why does it seem like I'm closer than you are? Why is You're my not. head look? Why does my head look so big? <laughs> You're I not. I told you closer. today is a shrinking day. Slide up a little bit and I'll slide back. How about that? I, no. That's so better. Let's That's stay better. together. Let's I don't know. stay together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Mary. He Love doesn't you, like it when I break into song, which I do all the time. Hey, Lori. Hey, Mary. Hmm. It's one of those days <coughs> I wrote the girls a message and I said, Please do not pull up any news today and look at it. And Erin wrote me back with a big frowny face and she said, too late. Ah, oh, hey, Yoshana, I love you. And why don't we see anything on here? I don't know, I see it on here. Yeah. Maybe you need to Is everybody seeing our video? Because <laughs> I'm not able to see it on, oh, wait a minute, you gotta push play. Hello, Miss Cheryl from Mount Hood, Oregon. I imagine Mount Hood is a beautiful, beautiful place. I'm going to have to back up. And there's my here. Haley Marie. I love you. I'm using my Magnolia teacup today. Isn't that pretty? The Magnolias are not blooming, but they will. It's not time for them to bloom. And my tea today. <coughs> Paul and I <coughs> have a lot of Irish, Welsh, mostly Scottish, um, Scandinavian blood. We have a lot of a lot of, of red blood in, in a Ireland. lot of red blood, but yeah. we are we are definitely of that sort. French, Lori, you know. There's just a lot going on in the news and um, a lot going on in the world. And I told the girls, I said, I'm, I, I am amazed at how the Lord has brought us to the Bible study, which is titled Focus. Because if y'all use a camera that has a zoom or anything like that, if it has an auto zoom, you know, you can be focused on a bird on the limb of a tree. But if there is a leaf closer than that bird, the camera will try to focus on that leaf and you, your bird will be all blurry. You know what I'm talking about? And it's that way with us as humans and I think women even more so. We, we have a focus, but sometimes other stuff kind of gets in the viewfinder and it draws our eyes away and our thoughts away and our hearts away so that we forget that thing we were actually trying to focus on, which of course is Jesus Christ. So when you look at the news, sisters, and Pearl is on the porch. Are you gonna go get her off the porch? I am. Our big Great Pyrenees, somehow we did not latch the door and so the Great Pyrenees is up on the porch and she is muddy, muddy, cause we're in rain. Anyway, where was I? I got lost. Um, anyway, our Bible study, you know, we're doing on focus and we need to keep our focus. And on the news, it's easy to focus on the negative. It's easy to focus on things that seem hopeless. They're out of our control completely. And so when we get stressed or we get panicked or we say, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? We know what's gonna happen. We know who our provider is, so so keep your focus there and don't let other things jump in the way. And we are getting lots of comments, so let me look. I see them popping up in my peripheral vision. 
Um, oh, thank you, Mary. I do sing a lot. I don't know why. Um, oh, Cheryl, we sure will be praying for that vertigo. That is a rough thing. Our daughter-in-law, Chrissy, has that. Yeah. Um, hey, Carol, nice to see you on here. Hey, Courtney. Um... Yeah, yeah, Lori, there is some stuff happening, but just don't look at the news today. Just keep Actually, your eyes off um, of it. There are days when I wished I'd never looked at the news. Yes. There, there, Angie and I discussed it in the past two, three weeks. It's like all the gates of hell are open and people are doing horrible things to the to each other. Children, the, the headlines, without even reading the article, it makes me want to scream and... I couldn't, I couldn't even read it to her. I'd don't say, don't look it. at the news. Don't look at the news. Because the headlines are horrible. That's right. Marianne, hello. Roberta, Katie. Um, there is no truth on the news. Well, Katie, we'll add him to our prayers too. And if I miss saying hello to anybody, forgive me. I want to always say hello to everybody. I love y'all, and I love that you're here with us. And... <clears throat> Um, so are you, oh, Mary, me and you, girlfriend, we will be in that heavenly choir together. We will make a joyful noise. Paul sings so beautifully and he's so kind to me. He never corrects my sin, <laughs> but I'm sure he goes, and then he thinks, it's a good thing I don't hear well anymore. Hey, kids. Hey, Isaac, <coughs> Charlie, Leah, Levi, baby Charlotte. Granny loves you. <clears throat> we sure will live, Dan. Do you want to open us in prayer, my I love? I would love to. Father, we come before you today thanking you for bringing us together again in a Bible study and in fellowship. And we ask, Lord, that you bless this study, bless our fellowship, anoint Angie to teach, and help us to all have the uh, ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't <clears throat> know why, but while you were praying... I remembered, well, it just popped in my head, and I try to focus when somebody's praying on exactly what they're saying, so it's unusual that this happened. I remember reading a story about an evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth. Do you yeah. remember him? Yes. How he stood up in front of the congregation or whoever he was preaching to, and he would give powerful sermons People would come to the Lord, be saved, the lives would be changed, all while he was struggling with kidney stones. Hmm. And I remember reading stories about him coming off stage and having to go and change his clothes because there would be blood from what these kidney stones were doing. And I... I don't want to delve into that too deep, but they, the message that what I was reading was saying that even in the midst of what God was doing through him, he was still suffering greatly, but he kept going. And I don't know if that's for somebody watching. I don't normally do this. It's just, this just came to me. If you're struggling and you really are in pain, whether it's physical or mental or emotional, whatever way, you keep going and trust God to take care of that because you don't realize whose lives you're changing. Mm -hmm. And I never do that. So I know that must have come from God because that's not, I don't do that. Um, okay, let me see what else I missed. <clears throat> Lori said, my brother-in-law is home, but on 10 different meds for BP, heart, sugar, COVID. Please keep praying. Absolutely. And on oxygen. Amen, Katie. Lenny says, when you sing, it gets filtered to the most beautiful music for our Lord in worship. <laughs> amen. Amen. <coughs> um, amen. Okay. Y'all know you can write prayer requests on there. We'll always read them. And please don't hesitate to comment. We love your commenting. And we have a neighbor we need for you to pray. She's yes. in the hospital. So please yes. pray. They um, went in for some heart problems. And they've actually not been able to help her 
like they thought they could, and she is, uh, I guess, waiting. waiting. She can't. She's not in in shape for them to fix her heart problems. So, please, just please, please pray lift for her. her. Um, Michelle Tree said, "I've been suffering from severe pain for the last two years. That almost exactly like kidney stones, and was misdiagnosed as such. It's worse being in labor, and really had me wondering what I'm supposed to do with my life." with all of this pain a part of it. You know, Michelle, there's a lot of folks who live with ongoing pain. Yeah. And we have several ladies that join us on here for Bible study every week mm -hmm. that, that I know personally endure <coughs> continual pain in their body and sometimes just can't even function. Um, so you're right there amongst a great, great crowd of sisters in the Lord who struggle. So just know that when you post that you have these situations, we all join in in prayer. And um, oh, I have to share something else, and I'm going to probably cry. I don't know if I told y'all a while back we um, began reading Pilgrim's Progress with uh, Haley's children when they come over here from time to time. I just read a few chapters and Isaac and Charlie and Lee and Levi remember that. And we haven't finished it yet because when they're here, a lot of times we're busy. But it's a wonderful book. And if you have not read Pilgrim's Progress, you really need to. And if, if the language is a little too complicated because, you know, some versions are written in the old style there's there's children's versions you can read those but it's a it's a wonderful wonderful um book and um there's a cartoon movie it's on what is it on amazon prime i think so anyway it's a cartoon movie which i just do not like to watch things that i think may have brought the respect level down for, for things. But anyway, um, we were watching it last night again with the, the Aaron's children. They were here, and um, Isaiah is seven. And as we were going through the movie, it's called Pilgrim's Progress. If you have Amazon Prime, you may can watch it on YouTube. I'm not sure. Anyway, the the road of patience or the, the way of patience which he has to walk up in this little show. They depict it as a cleft walkway up granite walls of rock. And just before it got to that part, we were all sitting there and Isaiah looked over at me. Now remember, he's seven. He said, Granny, this part always makes me cry. And I said, it does me too, Isaiah. It just, if you watch it, you'll know what I'm talking about. But, you know, Christian, the main character in the book, is carrying a burden on his back. It looks like a backpack. And he's carrying the burden, and he's struggling up this hill of granite. And it's very narrow. It's just wide enough for him to climb the hill. And at the top of the hill... The light is shining down on him, and in the, the little cartoon, it's in the form of a cross. It's light beams in the form of a cross. And as he's struggling, literally on his hands and knees, to get up this difficult pathway, finally the, the burden begins to fall, and it falls off, and he can stand up. And when he stands up and he sees the light in front of him and he throws up his hands and he says, I'm free. Isaiah and I were both just crying our eyes out. And it, it's just a moving depiction. But you know what? That's really the way it is. And we all want it to be easy. We want to make it easy for everybody, but it's not easy. And those of you who are sold out to the Lord know what I'm talking about. It's easy to say a prayer. It's easy to get emotional and then feel like it's all over. But when you walk that walk, 
to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the foot of the cross. It's not easy. It's something that requires something of you. And I know that goes against so much doctrine, but you know what I'm talking about? Yes. It requires your death. It requires you to say, no longer I, but Christ. And I don't know why I'm telling all that today, except I just feel like we need to focus. No matter what comes in the future and no matter what you're dealing with now and what no matter what's happened to you in the past, Christ is the point. He is the point of all of it. So we got to focus on him. We've got to focus on on living this life in him. And the rest falls away. Amen. Do I digress? No. no. I have one I have a scripture I want to Please. share that went along with what you said about Smith Wigglesworth. Okay. And about suffering and how you feel weak and Michelle and things you had and some of the other ladies. Uh Second Corinthians twelve. 10, Paul said, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. So when you're weak in the flesh, you're strong in the spirit. That's one of the reasons why fasting, um, denying your, your flesh of things, that's one reason why it focuses you on spiritual things. That's right. We have a dear friend right now going through a battle for her family. And I saw her the other day and she said, I am fasting. I am fasting. And I don't know that she's ever fasted in her life. But she wasn't telling me she was fasting because she was bragging on it. She was telling me that this is the weapon the Lord is going to use to break the enemy. Right. And so many times when we see pastors and teachers and great men and women of God and we we um and and maybe they even exude exude that presence but we always see them as successful prosperous um fat and happy if you will you know what I mean they <laughs> yeah. just they're just in charge bold as a lion um and I don't see the the child of God that way in the word. I don't see him. I see him as ever pray. The, the spiritual warrior always turns and looks to the king to, to say, what's my next duty? Yeah. You know, I'm suffering, Lord, you walk with me and I'll go. And that that um, story, Yeah. Um, that really, it, it's ages old, and yet it still speaks to all of us who are walking the walk. Amen. There is power <clears throat> in the Lord. Um, okay, I just see discussion, and I will read all of that later. Okay, how are we strong when we are weak, Michelle says? Because we are strong in him. Our weakness causes us to do things on many planes, many levels, that can deter the move of God. Our emotions get the best of us. We say things we don't want to say. We shouldn't have said. We make decisions. I was talking to one of the girls the other day and they was saying, I am so tired. I haven't had much sleep and I guess I'm going to have to do this. And I said, don't make a decision when you're exhausted because mm -hmm. usually it's the wrong one. We're, we're functioning on the mentality of trying to make things Easy, fast, yeah. and that's never the, the best choice. Um, we had a friend years ago, and his little thing with his family was, if I, have to, if I have to give you an answer now, the answer's no, no matter what the question was. He, is, he was never rushed into a decision. Now, obviously, if it's whether or not to lift the car off a little child, that's not what I'm talking about, but other things, y'all know what I mean. Um. But that's when we are weak, we can depend on the Lord and we can look to the Lord and that's what makes us strong. Do you want to add to that? No, and you are right. Quick decisions are usually the wrong ones. We don't have time to think. That's why certain type salespeople in the world want you, oh, you need to do it now. Today and today only with this deal. Well, we've, you've, got to, you've got to make this decision now. 
I, I once knew a person who was sold a cemetery plot because the man said, you know, you can't buy them after you're dead. <laughs> that well, is true. And, and the person didn't stop to think about how, why he said it that way. It was sort of a tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. But they said, I, I need to buy, oh, I got to get one. You can't buy them after you're gone. Really? When we are weak, the Lord becomes the answer. And a lot of times we have to be brought down to weakness in order for him to be that in our lives. Isn't that sad? I told Paul, I saw a meme come across Facebook this morning and I, it was from a dear friend of mine who I know is a prayer warrior and loves the Lord. But I, when I looked at it, as wonderful as it looked, I thought, I am totally opposite of that. And it was a little kitten, and it said, before we pray. And then it was this big lion standing there with the wind blowing its mane, and this is after we pray. And I thought, I am so opposite of that. But hear me out. Because we think when we come in, we're, we're sort of feeble. We don't really have any strength in us. But after we pray, we're strengthened, we're emboldened, and we can move forward. And that's true. But for me... Usually, if I'm pressed to pray on something, I'll come in there to the Lord, and I say come in there figuratively, and I'm like, okay, Father, this is what's going on. This is what we've got to do, and, and I'm like, yeah, and then, and now, I'm not like that anymore. I go in there thinking, ah, oh, I've got the answer, Father. We just need to work together on this, and now I come out like this little kitten. And I just feel, you know, nothing scares a kitten, does it? No. Little kittens are just just cuddly and lay on your lap and they just fall asleep so quickly, just rubbing their little belly twice and they're out. That's the way I feel now. I come out of that prayer time like a little kitten, like I can just be at peace. Not always. Sometimes I don't, I don't do that to be completely honest, but I'm more like that now than I used to be. I don't come out with that fierceness like I used to. And I think that's a good thing because I have learned I control nothing but my reaction. And I'm going to make sure that I lay in his lap and let him take care of it. And I have to open, uh, uh, audibly say to myself, Angie, just calm down. The Lord is going to take care of this. And I say it to myself. And I'll go to Paul and I'll say, okay, talk me through it. And he will. But while being bold and all of that is wonderful and that's great, we need to work toward being that little kitten that just rests and trusts him and knows that it's going to be okay. Not just say that it is know it. I loved that thing. I don't know if you saw it on the news. President Zelensky of Ukraine, he stood out. He It was a video he did, and our days are opposite of theirs, but he was standing out in the courtyard of wherever he is at his office or whatever, and um, I, I think he said it was the first day of spring over there, which I don't know how that's so different from ours, but he was talking about you know, it's the first day of spring. And then he looked at the camera and he said, it's going to be okay. And then he winked. Hmm. And I thought, for his people, I don't know anything about this man, ladies. He may be the most ungodly man that ever was. I don't know. But the confidence that he wanted to give his people spoke volumes and I think we as Christians miss that when God looks at us and says, it's going to be okay. And then he gives us a little wink to say he knows what he's talking about and that he's with you. It is going to be okay. Whatever happens, mm -hmm. it's going to be okay. If we walk in faith and focus on Jesus Christ. And now I've talked almost 30 minutes and I hadn't even started my lesson. That's okay. You did a little singing, too. Did a little, you want me to do some more? <laughs> Go ahead. This is, <laughs> this is your Bible study. And listen, those aren't dumb questions. Never, never. Yes. 
Um, and, I, and I will add to what the other ladies have said to Michelle about the question is, um, there are no dumb questions if you need to know the answer. And, the, and to me, the, the answer is that when we're weak in our bodies, we tend to more let, let the Lord do it because we can't do it. So not just weak physically, but weak in the flesh of we can't, a situation we can't control uh, and what Paul was talking about, all the infirmities and the weakness, it's truly the controlling it with your your spirit man, right? Amen. You're, you're truly giving it over to God. And you can, I've seen, I've seen little uh, grandmothers in the nursing home, great grandmothers that were absolute prayer warriors they couldn't feed themselves, but they could pray. They could pray. And and you would go in there and you'd feel the presence of God and you'd say, I'm gonna pray with you, and you'd pat them on the back. And they say, Can I lead it? And they would just boom. Yeah. You know? And um it, it really taught me a lot that we don't we we shouldn't be dependent on our physical strength, our physical um uh, qualifications, you know, we or our knowledge, or our knowledge. A lot yes. of us know a lot of the word. We know a lot of it. We can quote it backwards and forwards, but that doesn't that doesn't mean everything. No. You got to know the one who wrote it. Yes. I don't mean to be so teary, y'all. Forgive me. I'm grieving over over things that are happening, but I'm also thankful. That's what this whole discussion is about. When we can do nothing, we know who can. So, let's get into Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, with an H. <coughs> um, of course, let me go back over very quickly our Bible studies. This, this section of Bible studies is focus. Um, faith, obedience, contentment, understanding, and service. And... Um, I want to read to you the two quotes that I said I was going to try to cover every time. Doctrinal distortion is a rationalization of our behavioral self-will. Don't distort the doctrines of the Word of God. They are always in agreement. They never disagree with one another. The Word of God is truth. Everything else is opinion interpretation, whatever. Make sure that what you believe is what is written in the Word of God. And don't get tangled up with other things. If your doctrine came from listening to somebody else, it's not on a firm foundation. Get in the Word of God yourself. Read what He says. And when you realize and you agree with the Holy Spirit or yeah, you need to agree with the Holy Spirit, not make the Holy Spirit agree with you. Then you're on a firm foundation. Then you can begin to branch out and listen to other teachers or other uh, ministers. But you know, you need to know that your foundation comes straight from the Word of God. Um, then the second one is, there is no revival without painful re-examination of the truth, without a preparedness to obey the truth, and there is no true reformation unless accompanied by the reviving work of the spirit of truth within us. Doesn't matter how long we do Bible study, we can do it for the next hundred years. The only thing that's going to change anything for anybody is a willingness to examine the truth and make the changes necessary in our own lives based on the truth, okay? And that was by Jeremy Jackson, that last um, quote. And you're looking at the, uh, hey, Miss Lenny, I love you. The, tr the word does not compromise. Nope. It's not emotional. It doesn't change with the, the circumstances or the news. The truth is the truth. And science is not the truth. No. Because science changes every day as we have. There's actually a line in the Bible that says, <laughs> science falsely so-called. Really? Yep. How interesting. Science falsely so-called. So, um, we are on Sarah. We did Eve the last time. And so, we're doing Sarah this time. This will be a two-part, if not a three-part, because there's a bunch there for us to learn from Sarah.
one of the best books I ever read was called The Daughters of Sarah. Um, Sarah was born in Ur of the Chaldees, and Ur, spelled U-R, is actually where Iraq is today. Um, she was born in, well, you know, do we know for sure, but 1,986 B.C., and she lived until 1859 B.C., approximately 127 years. Um, amazing. <laughs> Her whole story is amazing. She married Abram before they left on their journey. She was barren, as was, was noted very early on in, in the word about her. And um, there's, there's a, you know, we were talking, what was it, two weeks ago about incest. Did mm. Adam and Eve's sons and daughters marry each other, and wouldn't that be considered incest? And we went over how they were clearly giving birth to children over a long period of time. And some of the children, you know, were born, grew up, moved away. Other children were born, grew up, moved away. And they may have never even met each other. Um, and, and DNA was pure at that time, so there was no concern about children being born with birth defects because of, of interlinear relations. And, but there did come a time when the Lord said, we're not doing this anymore. This is stopping. Um, but those were just little bits of information about um, Sarah. So let's go to faith. Faith grows as you get your eyes off of yourself and your problems, your limitations and failures, and on to the living God, the Lord for whom nothing is impossible. That was said by Colin Smith. Let me read that again. Faith grows as you get your eyes off of yourself and your problems, your limitations and your failures, and on to the living God, the Lord, for whom nothing is impossible. I thought that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. The word uh, in the Strong's Concordance in Hebrew is iman, which means faithfulness, Trusting in Greece, it's pistis, which means trust, confidence, fidelity, strong conviction. Do you have faith? You must have had faith at some point because you can't come to the Lord without it. But do you walk in faith? Um, let's read Genesis chapter 11, 27 through 31. Yes, and I've already posted these first two readings in Genesis, so they're in the notes. We've had a lot of comments, so if you'll scroll back, the Genesis books, the first two that we're going to read from are already in there. And this is Genesis 11, 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan, and they came into Haran and dwelt there. So this is the first mention of Sarah in the word of God, and what does it say? She was Abram's wife, and she was barren. So her marital status, and whether or not she had kids. Not a lot, is it? Nope. And yet, look at what she became to all of us. She was married and had no children, and that was her label. Yep. We don't like to talk about labels. We don't want to be labeled. Nobody wants to be labeled. We all use labels. We all use them, and it's okay. Sometimes we get labeled ugly things. There's no reason to get mad about that. Don't get offended. You know who you are. You know whose you are if you're born again. Don't let that stress you. But as a woman, especially in this time period, being called barren, 
was torture. Obviously, everybody else in the family had kids, but she did not. And that's something I want you to keep in, in, in your forethought as we study, because there are things that all of us feel like we should have accomplished or we should be accomplishing, and for some reason it doesn't happen. And, and, and when we have that situation in our life, it is easy to focus everything on what is not there. It's like a spinster. Yes. Someone being labeled a spinster. Because she never married. And she spun a lot. And you know. <laughs> she was spun in circles. She spun in circles. Looking for a husband everywhere. Spinster. Silly. But it's important to realize that everybody who has a brain, and we had a nice discussion with Polly about that last night, everybody who has a brain has something that they wish that they could have done or still want to do. I would love to have raised horses. We had horses for a short period of time. I would have loved to have raised horses, but that is clearly not in the plan for my life. I don't know. It may be soon. We may have to go buy a horse or two. Um, so I wanted to start right there to keep, keep your focus on that for just a few minutes. Now, Genesis 12, 1 through 5. <clears throat> Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and all the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. I want to ask you a question. Look in verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee. And there went some thunder. And curse him that curseth thee. Why the plural on the first part and the singular on the second? Do you think? I don't know. Maybe uh, it is, may, it might, it, by grammatically saying them, it might be those, bless those that bless thee, not necessarily a group, but them. It didn't say bless him that blesseth thee. That only, I don't even know if that's proper in King James English to say, bless him that blesseth thee. Hmm. I don't know. There's little things like that hmm. in the word that I, I I don't think are mistakes. I think there's something there, but I don't know the answer. And I just wanted to point out when you're studying your Bible, don't get hung up on little bitty things like that unless you believe the Holy Spirit is showing you something. Then study it to the hilt until you get the answer the Holy Spirit has for you. Um, so, I, I want us to follow Sarah as she's traveling. Remember, she's got no child to watch after. She's got her husband. She's got her nephew and her father-in-law and all of them that are going with them. Um, in verse 5, And Abram took Sarah's wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered. <coughs> Now, Lot's father died, right? Right. So, obviously, Abram wants to make Lot his heir. At least he can take care of his brother's son, and this will be, you know, blood, a blood kin. And, you know, over time, we see that that was a common mistake for them to try to gain an inheritor for their their being. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, Hebrews 11, 11. <clears throat> Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, what I wanted to, to do on these three sections of Scripture is to show 
that this woman did not have a perfect situation. She did not have the classic home and family and babies to take care of. And, you know, she had a situation here that none of us would admire. I don't know about y'all, but I would not want at my age for my husband to walk in the door and say, honey, we're moving. We're out of here. And then you've got to pack up everything and heaven forbid, get on a camel and go out to somewhere you've never been and try to start a whole new life there and then have to do it again. And and the whole time not having children to help her, but also wanting children. And, and, and in my mind, I got this vision of a truck driver that his wife has to go with him and They've been trying to have babies for years, but they, they're on the road all the time. They're for go, 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 and this is Abram. He's moving, and he continued yes. to move. He didn't just go to one place. That's right. It was a continual sojourning until he got to where God led him. And, you know, I think about Sarah. I really do think about her all the time. She was not brain dead. No. This was an intelligent, thinking woman who had probably been at least in the doorway of every major conversation that took place. She knew what these men were talking about. She knew her husband. And step by step, day by day, year by year, she had a faith growing in her because she could have just said no. She could have just said no. I'm not doing that. That's a lot to ask of a woman. And she can't even look at her offspring and say, well, this is for their inheritance. We're going to go because we'll be able to give our children more. She didn't even have that. Um, in Hebrews 11, 11, which Paul just read, she received strength through her faith. To me, that's one of those lines that needs to be put on the refrigerator. My faith will strengthen me. It will make me able to handle what's coming next. You must have faith. What is faith? Trust. Trusting confidence. Fidelity. That means not wavering. Strong conviction. And like I've said before, in the Psalms, we see David or the psalmist continually encouraging himself. Lift up your eyes. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Sometimes you got to do that. And right now, you really may have to do it more than ever. But don't do it out of fear. Do it because you know who God is. And you know he's got your best. Galatians 3.29 And if ye be Christ's, then ye are then, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians, New Testament, Galatians 3.23. 29. 29. If you are Christ, you're heirs because of them. I mean, <laughs> I know that Sarah is up in heaven right now. And I don't believe that when we're in heaven, we'll be able to look down on people here on the earth. But she's got to see. She's got to see standing in heaven, worshiping at the throne. The magnitude of the faithfulness that she lived on this earth. She went through some really rotten, unfair things. Yes. And apparently kept her mouth shut. And apparently... We don't read that she didn't. Yeah. She didn't back talk. Right. She laughed. We're going to get there. <laughs> Romans 4, 20, 21. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. This is talking about Abraham. But 
it's also talking about Sarah. Amen. As a woman, and I'm 58 years old, I have gone through my reproductive years. I have borne my children. I have lost children. And, and my time of life has shifted. My womb is no longer fertile. Aren't we glad this is a women's Bible study? And Paul knows this. My womb is no longer fertile. I'm not going to be bearing any more children. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I can't imagine. That wouldn't be so bad. Wouldn't be so bad. I can't imagine for a woman who was not blessed to bear children in this time period, I mean, when Abram and Sarah lived, there was no infertility clin or fertility clinics. There was no surrogate pregnancies, although we're going to read about one. It didn't quite work out. No. Um, every day, moving forward, knowing that you do not have someone to pass on everything that you're living for, that is hard. Yeah. It's hard. I want us to really get a picture of who this lady was. She was not just some matriarch of the Christian and the Jewish, and she's just... This was a woman, a real woman, living out in the desert with a man who seemingly couldn't make up his mind. This was a woman who suffered from heat. I don't know if their food situation, if she always had food to eat. There could have been days when she didn't. She struggled, ladies, but her faith strengthened her to move on to the next day. And when things are looking really rotten in your life and they don't make sense and you pray and you pray, I guarantee you Abram shared his faith with his wife that there was a God a real true God that loved them. You know that he told her about this God that he believed in. And he built her faith up. But her situation was not changing. It wasn't looking good. We just got an angry face, I think. Um, it wasn't looking great. It was sorrowful. It was sad. Yeah, I'm sure she had a good time from time to time, but it's always back there in the back of your mind what's not available. Do you think I'm right? I'm sure you are. They didn't even have cable TV. They didn't have cable TV. They couldn't that. read a book. <laughs> have a cup. Well, they may, maybe they had a cup of tea. Uh -oh. I don't know. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't waver. And he, had, he was building up his wife. But his wife could still see his failures. His wife could still see the things that weren't right, as we're going to get to. No flush toilets, no running water. That's right. Um, and he was fully persuaded. And you know, when, when you have a husband that is fully persuaded, sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a not so good way. <laughs> but when your husband is confident, it really gives you a place of peace and safety. And for those of you who don't have a husband in your home, maybe he's not born again. Maybe he's not walking with the Lord. Maybe you're a widow. Maybe you never married. God is your husband, and he will not fail you, and he does not waver. Try really hard, ladies, to get that into your daily, constant thought process. God is my husband. I am not alone, okay? But that's how your faith grows, little bit by little bit. And I think that was very, very... Um, I don't think the, the mustard seed faith is taught enough. We only need a little bit of faith for miracles to happen. Amen. But you know, if, if y'all aren't gardeners, you're just going to have to trust me on this. When you have a mustard plant that sends up a seed stalk, when that, 
when that thing goes to seed, one plant produces thousands of little teeny tiny seeds. They're everywhere. And if you don't want that mustard seed to grow into new plants, you got to get out there and clip that thing off into a brown paper bag. And I did it many times saving seed because those seeds go everywhere. So every time you use even a tiny seed of faith, it can produce like you can't imagine, not just in your life, but in all of those around you. It's amazing what God can do with just a little bit from us. And I'm um, not connected with the problem with a woman in a traveling position because, you know, I think as a man, but um, that's... That's what made me think more about Sarah because of what you just said and all these ladies understand, you know, this home has the reflection of Angie, everything about it. Every room is decorated by her and I have a shop where all my stuff is there. And, and so it helped me to think about, you know, not having to be able to decorate your home or whatever. We've got a camper that we pull to some local campgrounds and it was like a little playhouse for Angie. The first thing she did was she <laughs> wanted to decorate. Can't you know? help it. She wanted to put her pots and pans in the cabinets and all that. And they didn't have that. I mean, imagine traveling by a camel caravan and for Abra or Abraham, it, w whichever state he was in, it was no big deal. He probably went out and did business that way. But for her, she didn't have her home. That's right. This is on top of wanting children. This is on top of, oh, I've heard about her. She doesn't have any children. And you know, and, and right. not to make a lot of that, it, it goes, y'all know, ladies, you know, it's just part of us. It's yeah. the way God designed us. And in this, in this situation, everywhere they would have arrived at, um, hi, I'm Abram. This is my wife, Sarah. Really? How many children do you have? It's always the mm -hmm. put the knife in and twist. The yeah. question you don't want them to ask. Yes. How many children do you have? That's I, right. I'm sometimes uh, reluctant when people get to talking about their grandchildren and they, they say, we've got four grandchildren now. We've got four wonderful. grandchildren. And boy, they're a handful and all that. And eventually, and I know the question's coming around and eventually they'll say, well, Paul, how many grandchildren do you have? And we kind of don't want to tell them? Yeah, I don't want to tell them. But then I'm going to say, well, I got 27. 27? And I said, yeah, I'm two great-grandchildren. And they, it's like, I'm not trying to, to stop the conversation. Well, but then it makes them feel bad that they only have four. Yeah. But, you know, everything, everyone is a blessing. Yeah. Every single life is a blessing. And we count our grandbaby that's on in heaven, you know? Mm -hmm. We count that one. We've got several that, that didn't make it to their first breath. And all of those are blessings from God and, and nothing to be belittled, but it is in a woman's heart. I, I mean, nowadays, I think these young women are getting away from having families, which breaks my heart so much. But I wanted to, and we're five minutes, so I'm not even going to go into obedience. We're going we're gonna to remain there. Um, hey, teen, I love you. Um, but I did want to just say, Sarah, next week we're going to talk about her obedience. And in some ways, <laughs> I remember saying in my younger years, if my husband had asked me to do that, he'd have been walking crooked. There's no way I would have done the things that Abram asked Sarah to do. But we see now that even the, the rotten stuff that she had to endure was for a reason. And I think if we, if we have situations in our life that are very painful, even things that are our own fault, ladies, let's just be honest, even the stuff that we cause to happen because of our foolishness or our disobedience or whatever, God can use every single bit of that for good. 
But if you don't walk in him, if you don't love him, if you don't have faith in him, if you don't trust him, what does that all end up being? Just horrible memories. I, know, I have horrible memories. I have horrible memories. Things that I continually have to submit to the Lord. But I know that if I commit to the Lord, every time those things pop into my head, God will use them for good for me and for others. You know, the babies that I lost, the, the horrible loss of, of babies, children, miscarriages, I can't tell you how many times I've been blessed to be able to minister to young women who've lost children, to share with them things that I learned and, and things that I was told by my doctors and help them and build their faith. There, there's just so many avenues all of us have, and every one of you, I bet, are thinking about it right now of things that you've endured that God has turned around and allows you, allowed you to use in sowing seed in somebody else's life. You know, when we, we have the barn and the livestock, and where there's livestock, there's poop. It's everywhere. <laughs> I remember that little boys and girls club that came to the house when we lived in Talladega, and they came and they to see the animals and all, and this one <coughs> little girl who had never been around any kind of farm animal, and she was walking through the corral. Now, we had sheep and goats, and they're... they're Let's don't get gross, but seriously, their poop is not in a pile. It's little pellets. And when they walk, they just drop pellets. And and um, she was like going crazy. She said, I don't know where to step. And her leader said, well, just, you know, step over. And she said, you can't step over. It's everywhere. Well, when you have a, a feeding area with about 30 sheep, it is everywhere. You know, you have to go in there periodically, rake it, put out fresh hay. All of those little pellets end up feeding plants in the garden. Okay, grass fat. The manure is composted and then put into the garden to grow plants for our family to eat. So all the little nasty stuff is used for our good on the farm. The same way in our life. Every horrible, nasty, ugly bit that has happened to you in your life, God can turn around that thing for good for you and for those around you. So don't begrudge those horrible memories. Allow the Lord to heal your heart. And when you can remember... I told this years ago in a Bible study about memories. It was called Jump Through Memories or Jump Through Pain. It's on our YouTube channel if you ever want to go listen to it. Whenever a memory of a tragedy happen, comes to you, if it breaks you again, if it leaves you so emotionally in turmoil that you just can't function for a while, you're not healed. You need to go back to the Lord and pray and work with him on healing your heart in that area. But when you can remember something, even devastating things, and not, not be emotionally broken, not sob into your pillow, you can look back on those, recognizing what they were, and, and, and then move forward, then that's healed in you. And that's a beautiful place to get to. A beautiful place. And there are things in Sarah that I believed over years, some she was broken for and some that she was healed of. And hopefully by the end of her life, she was healed of a lot of it. Amen. You know, we see later on in her life, she could be a real snit and it hurt people. But she endured a lot too. So we'll close with that. I hope y'all understand what I'm meaning by this. I see there's a lot. <laughs> Laurie said, <laughs> all that crap helps a lot of other things. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Romans 8, 28, yes. All things work together for good. Oh, Michelle. Michelle said, this is just awesome. I will never look back on the bad things the same way. Hmm. Amen. Oh. Uh, 
I know I'm missing some. So like, so Christ is like a farmer, and he can fertilize our life with the bad things so we can grow. That's just awesome. It is awesome. It is powerful. Yep. And, you know, even we're having a storm outside, and even when you have storms, we've, we learn this so often. Sometimes we'll actually pray for a little thunderstorm to come through because when you have a dead tree or dead branches that get hung up high in a tree and you couldn't possibly reach them, the only way they're going to come down is in a storm with a lot of wind and a lot of rain and a lot of bluster. And that brings those dead things down so they can be dealt with. And sometimes when you're having a storm in your life, ask the Lord, Father, are you trying to get rid of some dead stuff in my life? Submit to the Lord. Give it to him. Allow him to do the work that he wants to do in your life yeah. through those events. Right. right now, the whole world is facing World War III. Are you in panic? I have moments. I have moments. That's why I say don't watch the news because it will make you panic. Well, be prepared. You know, be prepared. That's right. Yourself. Don't take it seriously. Don't say that'll never happen. Just say if it happens, yeah. we're ready. And it is going to be okay, even if it does happen. You do the <clears> things when you have a fear come up in your heart. Use that moment to pray and ask the Lord to help you understand what you need to do to take care of that. Let all of that, you know, it's just like that, that refiner's fire. You put gold or silver in a pot, you heat that thing up into a melting point, and slowly, and we know this because of soap, when you make soap in a big iron pot, you get that thing to roll and boil, Oh, every now and then stuff just starts coming up to the surface and you just take your little scoop and scoop that mess out. Throw it out. That's the, that's the beauty of a refiner's fire, getting the crud out. And then you've got pure beauty. If you've never made soap in a, in a pot and poured it up into your molds, oh, it is so beautiful, isn't it? Yes. Just, just soft and velvety looking and all of the crud is out because you've tended that thing. So tend that thing in your life and get rid of that fear and get rid of that panic. And I'm working on that myself. We all are. That's why I can share it so <laughs> freely because I know what you're going through. We love y'all. And I hope y'all have enjoyed it. I have. I'm going to go back and read all these wonderful comments. You know, you know, let me say one more thing about stocking up because... Michelle said they were stocking up. We have we have storage too. We all these is a good good place to go. Um, knowledge is a good thing to store up because if you can't have access to storage, if you've got knowledge, you be okay. Of course, the Lord will be with you either way. Yeah. But knowledge is a good thing. Learn how to take care of yourself, even if you was walking out in the woods, right? God bless you all, and we will see you Thursday night. Yes. Do you know what your Bible study's on? I think it's on the flood. Oh, the flood. we need that. <laughs> Boy, do we need that one. I think it's the flood. <laughs> and I want to say one more thing about preparing since that, yes. that little rabbit trail was brought up. I talked to a lot of people through the years about when times got bad, preparing it, this kind of thing. I remember my grandfather who had lived through the depression and people that had lived on a farm life where they just grew their own food they didn't depend on stores that much except for maybe sugar and things they they didn't notice the depression that much you may not want to have a preppers mindset you may think that's unchristian I don't think so I think that all through Proverbs we're taught to prepare mm -hmm. a lot of people say I don't have the money to prepare if you, in your grocery shopping, will buy one or two cans, one flat, if you go to an Aldi's, we buy a flat of one of vegetables and put those up. If you don't have room, slide them under your bed, put a date on them with a magic marker and use those things. Um, FEMA in our country, those of you who are in our country, FEMA tells everybody to, to have three months supply 
-hmm. Tina's down there where hurricanes come in. I know she knows about this because she's had to endure weeks without power. Um, there could be trucker strikes. There could be um, a drought. There could be a, a war go on somewhere. There could be storm, local storms that knock out the power. Uh, it could be so many things. Right now we're experiencing them on multiple levels. Yes, and we've been up to, in our area here in Alabama, we've been up to seven days without power before uh -huh. after a storm. And it's just common sense. It's not hoarding and it's not uh, not trusting God. I think I think he wants us to be prepared. And this is off track from our Bible study. I think it's important, but though. But it is in this, in this time, it's important to just have some stock and that way you can feed your family and not have to be in fear. I mean, think about it, if you're obedient and do what God's told you to do in preparing, the ant puts up for the winter, in Proverbs it says, if you prepare that, when the storm comes, you won't be crying out to God, how am I gonna eat? And you only buy groceries every, I know in the big cities sometimes they only buy groceries every day or every two days, they buy it on the way home. They don't stock up much. Yeah. You can't live like that. The world is changing, and um, if you're not being a, a weirdo prepper like the world wants to paint preppers. You are being someone who takes care of your family. Wise. Just be wise. Be wise. And, um, and you know, one of the things, uh, and I was telling the girls the other day, one of the things a friend of ours does is she goes to buy one, get one free sales, and the one that she gets free goes in her little storage closet. Um, for those of you who are interested, we have uh, some canned goods racks that I built, and Angie might want to take a picture and share it with anybody that wants it to see a picture of it. I uh, sort of designed it myself and, and all that, but it's uh, troughs where you drop the cans in, they go down, you can see exactly what you have. She keeps corn and beans and all that in each one, and that way you use the oldest stuff at the bottom first Take it out of the bottom, it just comes out. It's like a dispenser. And we've got a couple of those. Uh, if you've got wall space for it. Um, well, just sliding stuff under your bed. Sliding stuff Putting under your bed, but make sure closet. you date it. Mm -hmm. Canned goods store for years. They do. And I'll tell you something. Medicine. I was talking to my doctor one day. We were up there having, we, we go to our doctor together and have our checkups. We have a wonderful, godly man that's our our local physician. Anyway, we were talking about medications and, and you know, I told him, I said, I had a little concern about the supply chains getting cut like they have been here for a while. And so many of our medications coming from overseas and we talked about that for a while, and, and he was working with us about that. But he said, let me tell you something about old medicine. He said, unless you store old medicine in a hot place with sunlight, he said, they'll last a lot longer than you realize. He said, if anything, the potency might go down some. But, but for the most part, if it's stored in a, in a cool, dry, dark place, it, it will last, except for things like that are liquid. You know, liquid medications are not going to hold their strength, like solid tablets and things like that. So I wanted to pass that on to you. If you have medicine, don't just throw away a medicine because it's, you know, a year old, unless it's a liquid, keep it, put it in your storage. It may not be as strong as it once was, but it's not going to transform into something that's going to kill you. You know what I'm saying? Now, talk to your doctor about that. Don't I don't give out medical advice. I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I just thought that was really good because I have thrown away medications in the past. Even, you know, things like aspirin or, or ibuprofen or, you know, stuff like that because, like, it'd be two years old and I think, well, it's no good anymore. Should have never thrown them away. Yep. So that's just a little... We had a lot of people wanted to see a picture of that. Uh, so maybe you could uh, somehow share that on Shepherd's Hill Farm page. You know, or... I don't post on Shepherd's Hill Farm anymore because, let me share with y'all, because a lot of you may be on our Shepherd's Hill Farm page uh, for two reasons. Facebook started mining 
pages for information. Um, there were a lot of hackers from overseas who were doing the robo bot, whatever that thing is, getting on there and mining those pages. And also, Facebook began to limit, like we had over 3,000 likes on our page, but they Facebook would only allow maybe 60 people to see what we posted. Yeah. And, and they wanted to charge me money to let more people see what we posted. Yeah, that was at, it was considered advertising. Yeah, well, and we Even don't sell we don't anything. Don't so make any money on it. I thought, you know what, <coughs> we're not gonna do that. I may do it again in the future if I if I feel like the Lord's given me peace to do that. And sometimes I really wish we had our website back. But you know, we even stopped doing our website. We were, had over almost two million hits on that website over yeah. the years. But then the Chinese apparently found it and started hacking stuff. Um, maybe we can just share a picture in the text of this video on Facebook, and it'll be so. Come back in a bit, and we'll try to get a picture of that. Yeah, I'll put it on a comment. On That'll a be comment, the best way. So. We love y'all. We're gonna quit now. We've talked for ten more minutes. I think it's good though. Um, y'all have a good week, and see you Thursday night.